Yeah. Moving on to item three, which is our highlight of the evening. And this is where we're to hear from our guest speaker, Mr. Dwayne Burt from Victoria Walks. Dwayne has more than 20 years experience as a planner and policy analyst in Victoria and New Zealand. Over eight years at Victoria Walks, he has focused on pedestrian oriented town planning and street design. His broad ranging role includes coordinating research, input to policy processes at all levels of government, communications and conference management. He's contributed to a range of guidance documents on topics, including vision impaired pedestrians, safer road design for older pedestrians, measuring walking and shared walking and cycling paths. Duane was previously a planner with Macedon Rangers Shire, the Auckland Regional Council and the city of Darabin. Wonderful. Um, oh, of course, we, we're joined by Ben Rossiter as well. Um, and other guests of note, uh, is, is Joe Eddy on the call? I haven't seen her name pop Not up. Yet. No. no, okay, right. No. She's on leave. Cool. No worries. So I'll, I'll hand over to you now, Dwayne, for your presentation. Thanks so much for being here tonight and welcome. Thanks, Jonathan. All right, just bear with me while I share my screen. All right. So, yeah, as um, Jonathan mentioned, I'm going to talk to you today um, about understand, understanding pedestrian crashes. So this was a study that the Monash University Accident Research Centre did for us uh, last year. Um, so I am going to... Um, hmm, sorry. Something not quite working here. Um, oh, here we go. Sorry, slight technical hitch there. <laughs> um, so uh, do feel free to, um, uh, if, it, if Jonathan doesn't mind, do feel free to ask any questions of clarification as we go, but um, there should be plenty of time for, for questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so the study was done for us by Jenny Oxley and Steve O'Hearn at MUARC. Um, it was funded by a TAC Community Road Safety Grant. Um, the study involved a pretty significant literature review and then um, data analysis over a 10-year period, um, firstly of police and TAC data, so the crash stats data essentially, uh, but also hospital data, the admissions and emergency department presentations, and also the national cause of death data file. So I think uh, just to try and summarize the literature review, which you know covered a lot of stuff, but one of the, the first things uh, it covered was uh, vehicle speed, which is obviously, I think everyone on this call will probably understand is a, um, a significant factor in collisions. Um, obviously the faster someone is traveling, the faster someone is driving, um, the less time they have to react and stop to avoid a crash. And if they do hit someone, then um, the faster they're going, the more likely they are to injure that person. Um, it looked at the characteristics of um, pedestrians and, and factors to do with the pedestrians themselves that might um, factor into crashes. The big one there really is um, intoxication. So um, the we don't have good data around intox intoxication of pedestrians, but um, the indications are that uh, it's, it's quite a significant factor in pedestrian fatalities. Um, not so sure about injuries, but um, certainly uh, fatalities, it's a big factor. Uh, we looked at distracted pedestrians and you know con concerns that uh, people were on their phones and that that was distracting them and they were getting hit. Um, the data around that is a bit mixed, but I guess in summary, no one's really been able to link um, pedestrian distraction to crashes. And those that have sort of attempted to or looked at that issue um, have found that pedestrian distraction is not a major factor in actual crashes. So um, we don't see that as, as a big issue. Uh, driver behavior certainly is, and um, uh, intoxication of drivers and uh, distraction of drivers 
driver speeding, of course, is um, a big factor in crashes. And um, a real emerging issue is vehicle design. As the as people start buying um, what was traditionally light vehicles, um, they start buying SUVs, heavy pickup trucks, big utes. Um, I'm sure you've noticed these vehicles getting bigger and bigger in size, um, uh, particularly if you look, you're like me out in the country, a lot of massive vehicles driving around. Um, and that causes quite significant issues for pedestrians because um, your likelihood of being injury, injured in a crash is essentially a, a function of the speed and weight of the vehicle that hits you. Um, but there's also characteristics of the vehicles themselves. So um, big SUVs, big, big um, pickup trucks tend to have a high front end. That means um, someone who's hit by that vehicle is more likely to go under the vehicle rather than over onto the bonnet. Um, so they may effectively be literally run over um, so that can cause um, much bigger injuries. And in the United States, we're, see we're seeing um, pedestrian injuries increase quite significantly, and that's largely been attributed to larger vehicles. So in terms of what the crash data is telling us, um, this is the uh, police uh, sourced data. So. Um, the sort of data that you get in the road toll and so on originally comes from the police and it's managed by the Department of Transport and, and to a lesser extent TAC. What that data shows us for pedestrians is that uh, there was a decline in pedestrian crashes between 2010 and 2014 before they started to plateau and we essentially got a stagnation in crashes. But that's just the police reported data. And the hospital data tells us a slightly different picture. Um, so first thing to notice, uh, well, probably obviously from the graph, um, pedestrian hospital admissions and emergency department presentations aren't going down at all. Essentially, it's flatlining um, at more than 1,000 per year for hospital admissions and emergency department presentations. So they're separate sets of data. The other thing to notice about that is that um, the total is quite significantly higher than what's picked up in the police reported crash stats. So you're talking around, well, more than 2000 crashes a year as opposed, opposed to the police data, which is picking up sort of 13 to 1700 um, crashes a year. Now, now more like 1300. So um, the data sources are important and not, they're not, all, not capturing all the crashes essentially. Um, unfortunately, there's a problem with the way we collect and, coll and more probably more accurately collate and report pedestrian crashes. Um, so crashes, uh, classified and that turns into statistics um, but the way pedestrian crashes are classified is really quite unhelpful um, so they're largely classified as near side far side or other um, which really tells us nothing about the circumstances we can get a little bit clearer of a picture when we look at the vehicle movement that tells us that um, vehicles going straight ahead um, are the biggest cause, um, of, cause of crashes, um, but right turn crashes are also very significant um, to a lesser extent left turn crashes and reversing crashes um, surprisingly high I think you'd say. Um, now we are talking to the Department of Transport about how we can maybe or how they can maybe manage the data a little bit better to make it easier for researchers to sort of understand the pedestrian crash circumstances. Uh, they do collect, they do categorize the data with what they call subcodes. Um, so it might be possible, but no one uses the, the subcodes for reporting purposes because they're so, so difficult to access basically. So we're talking to the to DOT about 
how we can improve this. Um, in terms of where crashes occur, this is largely a reflection of where the pedestrians are. Not that surprising. So the CBD and inner suburbs um, come up as a hotspot. So you've got a heat map there on the, on the right. Um, activity centers around railway stations, you get a lot of crashes, um, but also major intersections and, and main roads, arterial roads. So that's not just because there's people walking there, it's, that's um, reflecting a real increased risk in those locations. Uh, and the report does have information on where the crashes occur in terms of council areas. So some people might be interested in that. Um, for us, it tended to once again illustrate that people were hit where there were high numbers of pedestrians. Uh, in terms of speed limits, um, so most crashes occurring in the 50 or 60k zone, 60 the most. Um, so that's largely reflecting, you know, the most common speed zones. Um, but you know, 60 not a high proportion of the road network is 60K, um, although a lot of traffic is on 60K roads, of course. But I can tell you that when you look at fatality data, there's a very strong skewing of, of fatalities to the higher speed roads. So about three quarters of crashes, or sorry, about three quarters of fatalities for pedestrians occur on 60 to 80K roads. And because we did such a comprehensive study looking at so many crashes over a you know, 10 year period, we had a lot of crashes and were able to report at quite a fine level of detail. So this is a pretty complex graph actually, but it details um, where at the time of day that people are hit um, and the age group of those people. Um, you probably, uh, it's, difficult to just look at the graph, but I can tell you one of the things that comes out is um, in the early hour of, hours of the morning, it tends to be young adults that are um, injured. Uh, so that's probably after going out at night, um, being injured on the way home, probably. Um, older people uh, tend to be hit during the day, particularly in the morning. Um, that's probably just a reflection of when they're out and about. Um, but we do know that older people are different, definitely overrepresented in um, pedestrian crashes um, and, and pedestrian injuries and fatalities. Uh, that's largely because um, their bodies are more fragile. So if they're hit by a vehicle, they're more likely to be injured and it's more difficult from, for them to recover. So that the inju injuries are more severe. Um, so that's quite a concern to Victoria Waltz. We've raised this in the media a number of times. Um, and the other age group thing to note here is that um, children are mostly hit after school, um, not so much before school, interestingly. Um, we've got pretty good data on the lighting conditions when people are injured. Um, <laughs> Sorry, a bit of an interlude there. I, I think that'll be fine. Um, <laughs> so uh, most crashes are occurring at night uh, during the day, but um, there is a significant proportion uh, at night. Um, and even though that's a smaller proportion than during the day, um, obviously people are less active at night. And so I think you could probably argue that this is indicating people um, at a higher risk at night. There's also a distinct trend through the week, and this surprised me a little bit, but um, uh, definitely a low on Sundays, and then the number of crashes builds up through the week, peaking on Friday, and then dropping back on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and one of the interesting things um, that you don't usually see in uh, this, this sort of reporting that we were able to get out of this study was um, the police perception of whether the drivers were offending or not in the crash. So police make a judgment 
in each crash about whether the driver was offending. They don't make um, a similar judgment about the pedestrian. Um, but this indicates that more often than not, um, the, the police consider the driver to be offending. We don't really know the nature of that offending, um, but they do collect reasonable information about whether the driver was intoxicated. And that indicates that um, in driver intoxication is not a particularly significant factor in these crashes. So in terms of the vehicles involved, um, this is hospital data now. Um, and the hospital data doesn't, you can see there, obviously, and unsurprisingly, the vast majority of people injured in collision with a car, a pickup, or a, or a, a van. Um, so the hospital data doesn't give us a good breakdown um, of those types of vehicles. What it does do, do though is pick up um, some of the sort of uh, some of the other um, types of vehicles that might um, injure pedestrians. So um, uh, pedal cycles, bikes, um, and pedestrian conveyances. So things like mobility scooters and um, skateboards and e-scooters. So more than 5% of pedestrian hospitalizations. So these are you know, fairly significant injuries where people have to be admitted to hospital. Um, uh, more than 5% caused by those sort of vehicles. And the significance there is that because those vehicles are unregistered, um, the, the pedestrian is not covered by TAC. So we've um, uh, been campaigning lately, you might've seen some media coverage to ensure that um, whatever type of vehicle pedestrians are hit by that they're covered by TAC. Um, so we're back to the police reported stats now, and um, that does have a better breakdown of vehicle type. And to get a sense of exposure, um, MUARC looked at pedestrian injuries per 100,000 registered vehicles. And you can see from the graph, the sort of standout here is um, the taxis and to a less extent, the panel vans and, and the buses. Um, and so these are overrepresented vehicles in pedestrian crashes. Uh, now there could be a, a number of reasons for this. Um, it could be something to do with driver vehicle or driver behavior or the vehicles themselves. Um, with the taxis, it's likely to be um, at least partly about the fact that they are driven a lot. Um, they're also driven in high pedestrian areas um, and might be driven, probably driven more um, around areas where you know, people are drinking and that sort of thing. So um, it's hard to know to what extent this reflects a real issue or, or just um, uh, luck, I suppose. When you look at vehicles involved in fatalities, so this is from a different data source again now, um, you get a slightly different picture again with trucks and buses becoming a much more significant factor um, and also trains. Um, so, yeah, those, but obviously, you know, if you get hit by a train or a truck, then um, you're in big, big trouble. So, um, they tend to get more represented in the fatality stats. Uh, so in terms of recommendations, um, MUAC set out recommendations in terms of safer road users and safer vehicles, but probably the most relevant for local government um, were the recommendations relating to safer roads. So they recommended reductions in speed limits um, including 30 kilometers per hour in priority areas. Muark were actually of the view that, sorry, Jonathan, I'm getting, I don't know if other people are, but I'm getting some sort of feedback from someone. Yeah, I'll, perhaps we'll ask everyone to mute uh, to, to see if that solves a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, so in terms of um, speed, uh, Muak were very much of the view that we would get really significant reduction um, improvements in road safety uh, with a, 
uh, a speed limit of 40 kilometers per hour. So um, it's not actually a recommendation in this report, but um, we released a position statement this year, which argued for a 40 kilometer per hour default speed, urban speed limit. So that would be your local roads, basically. Um, and, and the 30 kilometers per hour in priority locations. Um, you know, also recommended um, you know, physical improvements to the street to, to deliver traffic calming, safer crossing points, and importantly, um, state government investment to deliver these things. Um, and that's an issue that Victoria Walks is um, very strongly focused on at the moment and will be definitely pushing for um, the state government to put its money where its mouth is over the next uh, few months in the lead up to the state election next year. Um, and we may be reaching out to local government to um, help us build the, the build that case, I guess. And um, we'll, we'll be arguing very strongly for increased investment. Um, so that's it from my presentation. Um, the study is uh, available on our website, along with all our other research. Um, so, yeah, I'd encourage you to check it out and have a look at our research generally. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dwayne. And uh, you, you said before,